Welcome everyone to Computer Science 4303, the first lecture of the new year. Um, my name is Dave Churchill. I'm an associate professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Uh, you probably know that if you're officially enrolled in the course, but just in case you're a viewer outside the course, um, that's who I am. And this course is going to be all about uh, AI for video games. So I teach three courses at Memorial. Um, I teach Intro to Artificial Intelligence. I teach, uh, that's Computer Science 3200. I also teach Computer Science 4300, which is Intro to Video Game Programming. And I teach uh, Computer Science 4303, which is this course, which is Video Game AI. So I teach AI, video games, and video game AI. So you can see a little bit of a pattern there. Uh, I love video games, I love AI. That's pretty much my life at this point. Um, all my research and teaching revolves around it. So you can imagine that um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to get into this course and for everyone to follow along and hopefully have a good time. So if you've taken any of my courses before, um, especially online, then you'll know how this is going to work. It's going to be pretty much the same as before with a few minor, uh, detailed tweaks. So here, um, let's first, let's go to my website. So my website is, uh, cs.mun.ca slash tilde churchill. If you're out there in uh, in the chat on Twitch, oh, I should mention that these lectures are being live streamed on Twitch, and then the recordings of those lectures are being put onto YouTube. Um, so if you want to follow along, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Newfoundland Standard Time, which is a weird time zone, but if you go to my Twitch channel, actually here, um, let's mute myself. So you'll see me, uh, in the background here for a second. This is where we're live streaming the class. If we scroll down, where's my schedule? If we go to click on Dave Churchill and then click on schedule, you'll see the schedule for the classes, um, in your local time zone, hopefully. Okay. So that's where you'll see you. I got this kind of recursion going on here, which is pretty fun. Uh, but let's close that. That's where the schedule is. So if you go to my website and click on teaching, you'll see all of the information uh, about all the classes that I teach with this course being no exception. So um, you can see here's my current courses that I'm teaching. I'm only teaching one course this term, which is this course, Artificial Intelligence for Video Games. Um, here you can see the Google Sheet link. So that is the schedule for the course. I'll get into that in a minute. You'll also see the uh, YouTube playlist for all the recorded lectures. Now that link doesn't go anywhere yet because this is the first lecture. It hasn't been created, so there's no, um, there's no lecture. Uh, so there's no playlist yet. But as if you're watching this on YouTube, this will exist, right? So this link will exist in about two hours. Um, or you can click on the syllabus, which will take you to a PDF file, which we are going to go over very shortly. Um, and if you want to, you can see the courses that I gave in the fall as well, which were, um, intro to AI, intro to game programming, and a graduate version of, of the other course. So all of these lectures are there as well. So for example, if at any point during this course, you feel like you want to brush up on your C++ or your SFML or your game programming in general, you can come over here, uh, to intro to game programming. You can click on that Google sheet and you can see all the lectures for that course. Um, and so you can go back, you can watch those, you can brush up on your programming if you want. So those are freely available to the public to watch. All right. For anyone who is not registered in the course, um, none of the assignment files will be given out for any reason to anyone who is not officially registered in the course. The reason for this is because, um, if I give out the assignment files to anyone who's not registered in the course, those will instantly be put online with the solutions and then I'll have to remake the entire course and I just don't want to do that because that's a huge nightmare. So there is no reason, um, there's no excuse, there's nothing that I will listen to to release the assignment files outside of the course. Um, the assignments will be hand delivered to each student's email and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So please do not send me any emails, uh, begging me for assignment files. They will not be given to you. Oh, thank you. Stream deck for deciding to update right now. Okay. We'll do that later. So yeah, the assignment files will only be given to students who are registered in the course. All right, let's go over the course spreadsheet. So this is the course spreadsheet. 
It uh, is basically your Bible for this course. It'll tell you everything that we're doing and it will also have links uh, to all the videos once they're done. So uh, over here, you can see all of the dates of all the lectures. So today is the 11th, I hope. Yes, it is. It's a Tuesday. This is lecture number one. This is the topic of this lecture, which is the intro to the class and the syllabus. Um, over here, you will be able to see the slides that I'm about to show um, for this lecture, and they'll be linked as a PDF file here. Those are also only available to students registered in the course. So people outside the course who are watching this on YouTube, you can watch this for free, but you can't download any of the files, unfortunately. Uh, we will link to the Twitch and YouTube VODs, as well as a download of the high quality version of the lecture, which again will only be available to students. If I open up a previous course that I taught, we can see what will happen once this course is filled out. So this is what the course will look like um, at the end. We'll have links to all the lectures. We'll be able to click here and say, okay, I want to know about this topic. You click on the YouTube, you click here, it'll take you straight to YouTube where you can watch that video. So that's, that's how this spreadsheet will look once we fill a bit more of it out during the term. Um, okay. Uh, over here is uh, all the assignment information. So this uh, class, uh, this course will have four assignments. Here I'm telling you when the assignment will be given out and when the assignment will be due. Similarly, for all of the project information, um, here's when the project will, or the, uh, the, that part will be given out and when that part is due. And over here, I just did a little date subtraction to give you a, a show you how much time you have to do all of those things, okay? So for example, you have about two weeks to do all of the assignments. You're gonna have almost two months to do the project. Um, so there's no excuses for late projects. Um, so that all of that information is there. Over here in the schedule, we have a little bit of color coding going on. We have blue things. Those are days where I go over assignments or project information. Um, so those are very important lectures. In white is standard lectures where I talk about uh, things that you have to know. Uh, in green here, that is when we have no class on those days. So for example, here we have the winter break. There's no class during our winter break. Uh, yellow here is that's when I'm going to give out all of the information about the project. So make sure you, you watch that one. That's very important. Um, and then more information about project and uh, assignment stuff here. At the very end, I'm trying something different this year. I think this will be fun. Once we've learned all we need to know about an intro to game AI, um, what we're going to do at the very end is I'm going to have some guest lectures. And these guest lectures are going to take sort of an interview format. So I'm contacting people that I know in uh, the video game AI industry uh, or the academic game AI industry who do things that are a bit different than me that I'm not an expert in. And hopefully I'll have them on Zoom and we'll stream it live on Twitch and I'll be able to ask them questions and the chat will be able to ask them questions. And so we'll have like a little bit of an interview. They'll say what they do. I'll ask some questions and then the chat can ask questions and it'll be a cool uh, sort of back and forth thing. So that's what I've scheduled in here for the last three or four lectures. I've already got a couple of people booked and still lining up a couple of more. So I think that will be really fun. Um, the thing that is different this term in terms of evaluation is that there will be quizzes this year. So uh, students at Memorial, we have this uh, system called D2L, Desire to Learn. It's sort of our online course thing. Um, and there is a quiz system on D2L. So every week we are in this course, we're going to have a short quiz, okay? Um, those quizzes are going to be a half an hour each. And the way it works is that every Thursday after the class lecture is finished, so immediately after the live lecture is finished at 3.30 or 3.15, whenever it is, the quiz will become available to do on D2L. So you'll go to D2L, you'll click on quizzes, uh, and then the quiz will be available. Whenever you start the quiz, you will have a half an hour to finish the quiz. The quiz should take about five minutes if you've watched the lectures. Okay, so review the lectures first, then start the quiz because you only have a half an hour to do the quiz and you can't repeat it. If I put on infinite retries, then it's no longer a quiz. You're just going to like keep guessing all the different multiple choice until you get it right. So the quiz is available right after class and that's Thursday at 3 p.m. And you have until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. to finish the quiz. Okay, so essentially 
what I'm doing is after the Thursday lecture, you have three days to finish that quiz. And the quizzes are sort of color coded here. Essentially, the quiz covers both of the lectures for that term. One of the things I found last year was that students were waiting way too long to watch the lectures. Say they'll watch them like right before the assignment is going to start or something or right before the assignment is due. And so what these quizzes are, essentially, they're only worth 1% each, but in total they're worth 10%. So you don't want to miss out on 10% of your mark, right? And so you have to do these quizzes and they're not worth much, but they're just going to keep you sort of on track with the course. So please watch the lectures on time so that you can do the quizzes on D2L. All right, so let's get into the official syllabus for the course now that we know um, sort of what this, what this spreadsheet is. So if you click on the course syllabus over here, it will take you to the PDF file. And let's zoom on that. And let's just go through this to make sure we don't miss any information. So of course, this is Memorial University, uh, Department of C Computer Science. This is Computer Science 4303. So this is a senior level computer science course. So if you're out there and you're, you're not in computer science and you're following these lectures and you find it a little bit difficult, this course is geared for people who have extensive programming um, uh, knowledge already. You must know things like you have the prerequisite for this course is our intro to AI class. So we'll be throwing around some artificial intelligence terms that I assume you know because of the prerequisites for the course. Um, I'll also assume that you know object-oriented programming, data structures, all this sort of thing. So we're not doing, this is not a low-level introduction course. This is a senior-level course in an official university, okay? So here is uh, my information, my email. I prefer students email me at my Gmail. You'll get a response much, much faster. So please use my Gmail. Here's my website. Here's my teaching website. Um, most of the course activity will take place on D2L. Um, there is also a class Discord server. Um, the Discord is not required, but it will help you, okay? So Discord is a tool that a lot of people are using these days. Um, I use it for pretty much everything I do, all, all the gaming that I do. You know, we do it on Discord with my friends online. Um, my classes have a Discord server. The MUN uh, Computer Science Society has a Discord server. Um, so please, if you can, Go to D2L, you will see the Discord link there. It is only for students, so please do not share the Discord link in the Twitch chat or I'll just ban you. Um, but please, please join the Discord server if at all possible. All right, so what is this course? This course is for students interested in learning about various techniques for artificial intelligence in computer games. Um, topics include an introduction to movement in games, search and planning, decision making, procedural content generation. Implementation of course assignments will be done in C++ and the SFML graphics library. A final course project will be to be, will be to implement an AI bot for a retail video game. So we'll go into that in a little bit, but the course project is going to be a huge part of the evaluation for this. Um, so please keep in mind that there will be a large course project um, when deciding whether or not you wanna uh, take this course. All right, so here's the course outline, a bunch of topics that we'll be teaching, and these are not necessarily in the order of instruction. If you want the order of instruction, go back to the, to the class spreadsheet. So I'm going to be giving an introduction to C++ and SFML. So we'll talk about C++ syntax, semantics, the STL, compiling, SFML basics, etc. cetera. Um, also an intro to game AI, what is it and why does it matter? That's gonna be today. We'll talk about movement in games, so stuff like space representations, planning and search, vector fields and influence maps, steering, smoothing movement, collision avoidance. Uh, we'll talk about procedural content generation, so things like maze generation, uh, map representations, map generation, uh, terrain generation, uh, grammars for procedural content generation. And um, we'll also be talking about decision making, so things like finite state machines, behavior trees, utility theory, uh, two-player search, all that kind of thing. And also, we will be talking about game AI competitions and bot creation, because that's, you know, game AI is all about creating AI for games. And uh, so we're talking about an intro to game AI competitions. I happen to uh, organize and run uh, one of the bigger StarCraft AI competitions. And so I'll talk about that and, and how we run it and why it's important. 
and we'll talk about some uh, some game AI bot case study analysis. So I'll go into like how I made a bot for StarCraft, how I made a bot for a game called Prismata, um, and then we'll talk about the final project, which where you're going to create an actual competition um, AI agent. So that's the course. Um, it's going to be pretty fun. I think I really like it. Um, so let's talk about more of the evaluation and technical details. So there's no official textbook for this course. I just put a couple of optional things in here. Um, like for example, the CPP reference website, you're going to be on that all the time. There are two lectures every week. So Tuesday and Thursday from 2 PM to 3 15 PM. The final grade in the course will be determined as follows. So the assignments in the course are going to be worth 40% of the course grade. They are going to be done in groups of up to two students. Okay. I've designed the assignments so that they are enough work for two people. If you're a super keener, you can do it on your own. I've had a bunch of people do it on their own. That's fine. But there is a maximum of two people per group. So the first assignment will be sort of an intro to C++, SFML, and AI assignment. The second one will be a more in-depth, super technical look at movement in games. Um, the third one will be all about procedural content generation. A bunch of students have told me that assignment three in this course is like the, their favorite assignment they've ever done. Um, not saying it will be your favorite, but like this, this assignment is, is pretty cool. So stick around for that one. And then the fourth assignment will be about setting up your project stuff. So downloading the API, um, and, and getting it all set up so that you're not leaving it all to the last minute. So one of the assignments is actually helping you set up your project. So that's good. 10% of the course will be quizzes. Um, so they will be done solo. Please do not work with your group member for the quizzes. The quizzes will be super simple. And if you, if you tuned into the lecture at all, you should be able to do those quizzes in about, I don't know, under a minute, maybe if you can click that fast. Okay. So the quizzes aren't going to be that hard. Finally, there'll be the project and the presentation of the project, which will be the, uh, 50% of the course. So half of your grade in the course is that final project and it will be done in groups of up to two people. I had an absolute nightmare with my game programming course with groups of four people. And I'll show you some of the feedback from that course. And the number one um, negative feedback from the course is that working in groups of up to four people online remotely is an absolute nightmare. And <sighs> Even if that was part of the evaluation, and I do want you to work with groups of people, I completely understand and I listen to your feedback. And so this course, the project will be done in two people. That means you'll have to do a little bit more work, but there won't be that same frustration of, I haven't heard from like partner number three in two weeks and they didn't submit their part of the project. Okay. Uh, so up to two people. So I, you know, recommend you don't have to stick with the same partner, but it's probably good to stick with the same partner as from the assignments. Um, or if you're really fed up with them or if they did a terrible job, you know, um, you don't have to stick with them, but the project will be broken down into four parts. Uh, well, technically five parts. There's the initial project setup. There's the project proposal where you will propose what you're going to do for the project within a scope that I've set. There'll be a project demo. So about two thirds of the way through the due date, you are going to have to make a video, which is a demo of what you've done so far for the project. Okay. So there's no waiting for the last minute. You are going to be working on your project throughout the term. And there'll be sort of a two thirds or three quarter way demo that you're going to show me what you've done so far. And then for the final project submission, you're going to submit your final code and you're going to do your um, video presentation that shows me all about your project. You're going to put that on YouTube and then you're going to submit that. Okay. This is very important. This is very important due to the online group nature of this course to show that you have individually learned the material. You must pass the final project to pass this course. If you're great on the final, Oh, sorry. This is supposed to be project. There is no exam in this course. Don't freak out when you, when you hear that when, if your grade on the final project is less than 50%, your overall course grade will be equal to the mark that you received on your project. If your project grade is greater than 50%, then your course grade is determined by the scheme above. So what does that mean? It means that if you get, let's say you got full marks for your assignment and half marks for your quizzes, 
So you, you got 45% of your grade already finished, okay? You cannot just do 10% of the project and pass the course. This course is all about that final project, okay? So you have to pass the final project to pass the course. Now, I'm not a monster. I'm not going to be like, oh, you got a 45% on the final project. You just instantly fail, okay? I had four groups in my game programming course last term submit projects that were not well done, okay? So each of those four, four groups, I said, all right, you got to do more work. And so I gave them like an extra couple of days and they, you know, battened down the hatches and, and got some stuff done, just enough to pass the course. But that doesn't mean that I'm giving out extensions to everybody, all right? Those groups had val very valid reasons um, for not getting their their present or their projects done on time. But don't be scared by this. All you have to do is a decent project and you'll pass the course, okay? All right, academic misconduct. I, I hate having to talk about this, but I have to talk about this because it always happens. There's there's just dirty cheaters everywhere, so I, I, uh, I have to say this sort of thing. This is a fourth year senior level computer science course. If you've cheated your way here, congratulations, but you won't be cheating your way through my course. All right, I take academic misconduct very seriously, especially for remotely delivered courses. If you're taking advantage of this pandemic to cheat, that's the worst kind of person, so please don't be that person. Anyone found cheating in this course will receive the harshest possible academic penalties that I can give out. Academic misconduct for this course includes, but is not limited to, the following. Handing in any material for evaluation that was done outside you or your group. Okay, so don't just go out and copy and paste solutions from Stack Overflow. You, you can't do that for this course anyway, because the assignments are pretty... Um, uh, pretty involved, but if you somehow got in, got access to an assignment from a previous year and you think you're going to use that, you're, it's going to be way less work and trouble for you to just learn how to do the assignment than any possible way that you can cheat, trust me. Um, if you obtain solutions from any non-class source, from anyone outside of your group, or previous course offerings, Stack Overflow, etc., unless I specifically state that it's okay. So for example, for a couple of the assignments, you may want to implement like really cool data structures or like bit operations or some sort of um, enhancement to make your code faster. So if you go out to Stack Overflow, for example, or another textbook or what some YouTube video and you find something really cool that you think could help you in an assignment, you can take that idea and bring it into your assignment. That's completely fine right? But you have to cite that source. You have to say, I got it from here. I got it from here. I got it from here. And put those in your assignment readme file or whatever. That's okay. But what's not okay is the base functionality that I ask for the assignments, I want you to implement. The enhancements and stuff, those that's where you can get hints from, from other sources online. Okay. Sharing of assignment or exam questions outside of the course for any reason including assignment sharing websites or online repos such as GitHub. Now, we will be using GitHub in this course for the project. In fact, GitHub will be the only way that you're allowed to submit your project. So we're going, we're going all in on GitHub this term. So I assume that you're probably going to be using GitHub to like work on your assignments as well. You don't have to. Assignments are going to be submitted via D2L, so that's okay. Um, but make sure that your repos are private on GitHub, okay? I'll be searching for very specific strings that I've put into the code and the assignments so that I will find it if it's public on GitHub. And if you do not, you gotta, you can't have it public on GitHub, okay? I sent out a bunch of DMCA takedown requests of students who put down things. It could end up shutting down your GitHub. So just please just make sure to, um, to make your code private on GitHub if you're using it. And I'm also giving out um, like runnable executable files that run in Windows um, so you can see what a working solution look like. looks like. If you reverse engineer any of that, like reverse engineering the binary solution that I give to you will be a hundred times more difficult than just doing the assignment. So I'm not too worried about this in this course. All right. 
So that's academic misconduct. Please just be cool, right? Don't be a jerk. Don't don't make it worse for everybody. All right. Um, just just don't cheat. All right. Now, the way that I have reduced cheating by a large margin in this course is that when I hand out assignments, assignments will be personally tailored to you. Okay. So um, soon, probably tonight, um, but by when is the first assignment out? The very latest you will uh, receive this email will be this weekend, but students, links to assignments will be sent to students via email. So if you've done 3200 or 4300 with me before, you're used to this already, but you will get personalized assignment files. All the files in those assignments in the zip file will be personalized to you. It will include your name, your student number, and a bunch of cryptographically inserted information into those files and project files and stuff that will make it so that if those files leak online, I will know who leaked it, okay? Um, I, I would find it very unlikely that you would be able to remove all of the identifying information from those files. And it would take you as much time to figure that out and, or probably more to figure that out and to remove it all then it will just take to do the assignment. So please, for your own benefit, for my benefit, and for the benefit of the course, do not post your stuff online publicly. Feel free to use GitHub as long as it's a private repo. And that's that's as far as I'll go with that. Okay. The mandatory COVID notice. All lecture delivery for this course will be done remotely and online for the entire term no matter whether or not MUN returns to in-person classes, okay? So I've gotten a bit of an exception for this course. Even before they announced that courses were going to be online because of the Omicron vi variant, I already had permission to give this course online. So this entire course will be online. There will be no in-person evaluations. We will never set foot in, even if you get an email from the university stating that all of your courses will be in person in February, this course will not be, okay? Trust me, it will not be. Um, it will not be affected by any COVID-related issues that may arise with the university this term, unless the university says it's it's blown up or something. You know, like, we're online 100% this term, no matter what. And then there's some Memorial University policy stuff that I'm not going to get into. It's there uh, if you want to read it. Okie doke. So let's close the syllabus. All of that information is there. Um, now what I want to go over with you is something that's very important to me, and that is student feedback, right? Um, so one of the things that's kind of missing from most classes, I feel, is, is you, right? A lot of profs just get up and they say, okay, here's what I'm going to do, and this is how you're going to like it, right? But I want to show you that, uh, so last term, after classes were done, I sent out this Dave's year-end survey. Right? And it had a bunch of questions um, with a bunch of scales, a bunch of numeric data, and long answer question stuff that I use to become a better professor, to become a better teacher. Um, and, and I take your feedback very seriously. Right, And so in order to show you how seriously I take it, let's look at the responses, which are all anonymous. Okay, So I want to go through this with you because when it comes time for at the end of this course, for me to, you know, I'm going to send out the same survey to you about this course. I want you to know that, oh, I'm going to fill this out because he actually takes this seriously, right? So let's go through the questions. This will take a couple of minutes, but I think it'll be really interesting. All right. So last term I taught um, 3200. It's grad version 6980 and um, computer science 4300 as well. I had uh, 71 responses to this uh, survey. That's between... I'd say a half and two thirds of the of the students that I had total for both courses. Maybe a little bit more because some students did both courses. All right, so the first question, which method did you use most often to consume the video lectures? So the three options, if we look back at the, the, the class website here, oh no, this zooms it in, um, are either watching live on Twitch, the YouTube videos, or downloading the videos later. So uh, by far, most people watch the videos on YouTube, which is absolutely fine. Uh, about a quarter of the class watched live on Twitch. So thank you to those who are here now watching live on Twitch. I hope you um, 
you continue watching live on Twitch so that you can interact with me and ask questions and stuff. And feel free, you know, I'm watching the Twitch chat. You feel feel free to ask questions and I'll answer when, them when appropriate. And just a few people uh, downloaded the videos from the website. That's really not necessary. I don't even know why you would do that. Um, now, hopefully the addition of quizzes this term will make the live watching of the web, the, the lectures a little bit more enticing, but we'll see how that works out. Um, I'm always looking for more ways to get people um, interacting and watching live, but I do understand that some people have other classes, they may have jobs or they're taking care of kids and stuff. And so that's why this course officially is being given via remote lecture. So there's, this is a really uh, interesting question as well. How long did you typically wait to watch the lectures after they were delivered? So, um, again, about a quarter of the people watch them live, 12% uh, within a day, 14% within 48 hours, 36%, uh, so most people waited, you know, around a week to watch the lectures. Um, and 14% were very honest and said, I didn't watch them until they were needed for an assignment or a project. So about half the class delayed watching the lectures basically as long as possible. And I don't want that to happen. That's not an ideal thing to happen, right? So out of this data, I introduced the quizzes for the class, okay? So the quizzes, again, are going to be by the Sunday after a week of lectures, you have to complete that quiz. And those marks will add up over time and they'll be the difference between an A or a B, maybe even a pass or a fail, depending on, on how well you do in the course, okay? Um, so this data is really important to me. And what I want is I want all of the class to be within 48 hours. That's pretty much what I want to be the norm um, for watching lectures. Okay, what device did you most often to consume the video lectures? So this tells me that the vast, vast majority of you are watching either on a laptop or a desktop machine. I'm using a desktop machine, laptop is fine. Uh, so one person watched on a tablet and a few people watched on their phone. You are very brave watching this small text on a phone. What is the resolution of the device uh, that you use to watch your lecture videos? So this is important to me because I want to know, hey, can you actually see the 1080p quality that I'm recording this in, that sort of thing. And yeah, uh, vast majority of people, let's see, only a couple of people are watching lower than 1080p quality, so that's good. All of the video quality is going out. What percentage of the lectures did you watch live on Twitch? Well, a lot of people watched probably none of them. Um, a few people watched most of them and a few people watched here and there. So um, hopefully we get more people watching live, but it's fine if you can't. What percentage of the lectures did you watch in total? The vast majority of people watched most of the lectures, so that's good. Um, I, I want people to watch the lectures in the class. How did your live lecture uh, attendance change between your in-person classes versus my online classes. So last year was really interesting. We had this sort of hybrid thing where some classes were online and some classes were in person. And so um, let's see here. I attended more live lectures in person. So 15% said that. Uh, I attended more live lectures online. So about double the amount of people attended more live lectures online than they did in person. A uh, bunch of people said there was no difference and a bunch of people had no online classes. All right. So uh, a bunch of people said like it was easier to take them online because, you know, I don't have to get out of bed. I don't have to walk to, to school, that sort of thing. Um, so I won't read all of those. Uh, okay, now I have a few uh, numerical answer questions. So if you took in person and online this term, how did you enjoy the courses? So I forget what my scale is here. So let me go back to the questions and see what this is. So, do, 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 do. So these are enjoyed in-person courses more is one and enjoyed online courses more would be five. Okay, so a lot of people enjoyed the online courses more. Um, very few people enjoyed the in-person co courses more. So it seems like of the people who did both online and in-person courses, they preferred their uh, their online courses. That's a little bit surprising to me, but that's fine. Um, what percentage of the lecture PDF slides did you go through for the course to help study or use for the assignments? Uh, the vast majority of people looked at most of the slides, so that's good. 
Do you feel that the course spreadsheet helped you stay organized throughout the term? So here, a one was strongly disagree and a five was strongly agree. Okay, so that's good. This is what I this is what I was hoping for that this course spreadsheet, which is now incredibly zoomed in um, because these are both Google sites. Um, the vast majority of people said that the course spreadsheet um, helped them stay organized throughout the term. So I'm really happy for that. So please use that spreadsheet. Um, did you feel that the class discord server helped you learn the course material? So the vast majority well, the majority said that yes, they strongly agree that it did. So it's between neutral agree and strongly agree. Um, so you can see here that please join the Discord server, go to D2L and get that link because most people who were on the Discord found that it did help them um, learn the class material. And again, the Discord server is for students only. All right. Do you feel that the class Discord server helped maintain a sense of community for the course? Um, again, uh, a bunch of people said yes, so that's great. I think it, it really did for me being able to interact and chat with the students. And anyone out there can tell you that I'm, you know, my third monitor always has Discord open. So if you send me a message on Discord, you're probably going to get a response pretty quick, as long as it's a working day, right? On the weekend, sometimes I, I, I leave messages unread until Monday, but I'm probably one of the quicker people when it comes to responding to, to messages on Discord. All right, this was an obvious win. So do you feel like the ability to uh, view lecture recordings after class time helped your ability to learn the course material? It was almost 100% strongly agree, right? And, and I completely agree with this. I think that having recordings of lectures is the best possible teaching tool that you can have. I can't even imagine three years ago when I was giving all these classes in person, that's it, if you, didn't, if you missed class, you missed the lecture. What are you going to do? Like you look at the slides, but you miss all the information of me speaking. Not only that, but it's so easy for me to answer questions because I can just say, go watch the lecture. And an added benefit of this is that some people sometimes ask me questions that were just so obviously answered during a lecture. So now sometimes people would ask me a question. I say, well, that was in lecture six. And they would say, oh, okay, I, you caught me. I didn't watch the lecture, right? So please watch the lectures before you ask me questions. That's, that's the only rule that I really have is, is put in some effort. For my classes specifically, do you feel like you were able to learn more or less effectively with remote, remote course delivery compared to traditional in-person delivery? So for my courses in particular, um, the vast majority of the students who took my classes felt like they were able to learn more effectively with um, online delivery. So this is like raw data showing that students prefer doing my courses remotely. And that's great. I, I, I'm very flattered that people think I, I do a good job remotely, or maybe I just do a terrible job in person. I don't know which of those two it is, but I hope it's that I do a good job remotely. So because of this response, the university like agreed to let me do this course online again, right? That's why this course is kind of a, a special case to the whole COVID thing. So I'm we're staying online because of that. Um, so for my course specifically, if you were to take it in a future term, would you prefer to take them as an in-person course on campus or remotely as I did? So one was prefer um, on campus and five was prefer online. So let's, we're staying online essentially. Uh, a bunch of people wrote interesting data, just they preferred it online because, um, you know, they can ask questions on the live lectures, just like in person. Uh, the ability to rewatch the lectures is really great. Uh, see the slides. I have a job. I have kids. I can do it at my own pace. All that sort of thing. Um, just really great responses. Um, so thank you for for putting in that. All right. Overall, for your courses, would you prefer to take future classes in person or remotely? Most people again um, said remotely, but it was a little bit more um, skewed toward um, in person. So. In general, people said, you know, some people just really love going to class. Some people really love staying home and watching classes in their underwear, right? It's, there's a lot of different things. All right. What was your group status for the assignments in my course? So for last year's courses, um, about three quarters worked with a partner and one quarter worked alone. All right. I don't have any sort of distribution of grades showing how working with a partner helped or not, but this question, 
Uh, do you feel like working with a partner helped you learn the course material? So this was strongly disagree. This was strongly agree. So, you know, we had a few people who ne didn't necessarily have a good time with partners, but we did have the majority of people saying at least positively, yes, they agreed that working with a partner helped you the course material. This was, do you prefer working with a partner or working alone? Um, this was working alone. This was working with a partner. Okay. So the majority of people preferred working uh, for a partner. Um, did you prefer working with groups of two for the final project or larger groups? The majority of people preferred groups of two. So that's why we're going with groups of two this year. So I, I, I care, right? I, I put out these surveys for a reason and I actually changed the way the projects work because of, of this feedback. So for anyone in this class who took the other ones, your feedback has been listened to loud and clear. We're going with groups of two for the project. People hate groups of four. Okay. For courses delivered online, do you prefer to have a final project or a final exam? Three, uh, two thirds of people, um, well, three or 80% said either final project or no preference, right? Not many people wanted a final exam. This course has a final project. Compared to other courses that you took online during the pandemic, my courses were over here was way worse and over here was way better. Okay, so thank you for, for your kind words. I just wanted to know how I did in comparison to other people. Um, oh, sorry, one second. One of these was more enjoyable. Do, do, do. I'm, I'm going to skip this because this is just me like, you know, tooting my own horn. So I don't, I don't like doing that, but people said I did a good job. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So here's the stuff that's specific to last term, um, where for specific classes, I asked how the assignments, exams, and projects were. Um, one was too easy. Five was too hard and three was just right. Okay, so 3,269.80, most people thought that the assignments were the correct amount of work, maybe a little bit too much work. Um, for 4,300, again, uh, most thought it was uh, just the right amount or a little bit too much work. For the midterm, they thought the midterm was either uh, just right or a little bit easy. For the final, they thought the, mid, uh, the final was just right or a little bit hard. That's, that's essentially where I want it. I don't want people to think it was too easy. Um, for 4,300, they thought the final project was too much work. Okay, so noted. I'll probably remove a couple of the... I, I do have things I'm, I'm working on for 4,300 next time to try and solve some of the issues that people ran into this term. And for the project for 6980, people thought that was a little bit more reasonable. All right. So uh, here are the MUN CEQ questions where one is like strongly disagree and, and five is strongly agree. Uh, so these are the questions that MUN asks on its paper CEQs that we no longer have. I just wanted to get that data if possible. So people thought that the requirements of the course were clear. That's great. Um, the instructor responded to students' questions effectively. People thought I did. That's awesome. That's really important to me that people feel that way. The instructor treated the students respectfully. Most people agreed. The instructor stimulated my interest in learning the subject matter. Agree. Awesome. Um, useful feedback was provided for my work. That was less so. I have to get on the TA this year um, about... Uh, per, we had some of the assignments that were being graded were a bit late being returned. So I apologize for that and your feedback is noted and I'll do better next time in getting better feedback. Um, the course instructor communicated course concepts uh, effectively. Most people said yes, that's great. Overall, people thought the uh, quality of the instruction was good. All right. Uh, the assessments helped me learn the course material. Uh, that was good. And the technology used, D2L, Discord, email, helped me learn the course content. That was good. And the workload was appropriate for the course. Here we get a little bit um, into the territory where people thought my course was a little bit too much work. But at least people thought that they learned it, right? So you can't learn if you don't do the work. That's, that's my motto. And my courses involve a lot of programming. So this is just to show you how people feel um, about the courses that I've done. Overall, the course was well organized. I feel like the course spreadsheet has helped me and the class stay organized um, over the term. So I had a bunch of um, course feedback. 
I'm not going to go over the best parts of the course because again, but I do want to show um, some of the <laughs> some of the worst parts of my course. Someone said, you seem a bit annoyed at times. What may happen is that you got a bunch of questions, many of them probably stupid, stupid and your frustration was felt in the um, the response. I, I take this to heart, you know, I, I apologize. Sometimes you're right. When you have 50 people asking questions, sometimes it does get a little bit frustrating and, you know, response, responses to students shouldn't include that, you know. I'm a human, but I'll try and do better next time. That that was not, the majority of the feedback wasn't me seeming annoyed or mad, but uh, um, people wanted the uh, solutions to the exam on paper or the exam itself. I can't do that. I'm not giving back the exams because then the next class has them, right? So there's a reason for that. I'm not giving the questions because that gets handed to the next class and put on Chegg, and that's, that's an absolute nightmare. Um, some people said... Um, you know, uh, most of the, the feedback was either the, the, it was a little bit too much work or, uh, my group members didn't show up. Right. So a lot of this is about group members. Um, the teammates in the final project, they go over, you know, um, some, someone didn't like that there were classes or lectures from outside the class. Like I linked to a couple of YouTube videos. Um, so that's the worst part. I wanted to show you that to show, like, you know, I do listen to this feedback. Um, okay. Uh, what are things that another professor did that you think I should incorporate? Um, do, 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 do. Live sessions of programming. Um, what else here? A bunch of people said no. That's good. In-person office hours. Well, that's going to depend on COVID. I will do office hours, like I have office hours on, on Discord, so I hope that's okay for people. Um, you know, there's no point in dragging you to, to my office when we could just video chat online. So that's the feedback. I know that took like, you know, 15 minutes to go through, but 15 minutes out of the 50 hours that we're going to spend together in this course to show you all that, I think it's worth it. So basically, um, you know, I care and, and I, want, I want your feedback to be heard and be incorporated back into the course. All right. So let me uh, unzoom the lecture here, do, 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 or the, the schedule. So today's class, now that, <coughs> oh, geez, excuse me. Now that we've done the lecture or the, the intro, let's talk about uh, actual, like an intro to the, to the course material, which is uh, what is AI essentially. Now, most of you have done 3,200. Um, but I, I'll just go quickly through this because, um, we should have a first lecture, right? And so I want to show you, there is different stuff here, um, from 3,200, but a lot of this is, is a repeat. It's like, what is AI that only, you know, you can only say that so many times. So let's get into the first lecture of the term. And I'm calling this sort of, um, what is academic AI and what is game AI? industry AI, because this is all about AI for video games. And it turns out there is a bit of a difference between AI and game AI. Okay. And that has to do with um, the differences between how people in academia work on artificial intelligence and how people in the game industry actually work on artificial intelligence. So what is quote unquote academic artificial intelligence, if you will call it that. So artificial intelligence Intelligence is sort of this term that, you know, you could write PhD theses on and they have, and it's a philosophical thing. What is intelligent? But let's just try and get something down on paper. So it's some sort of capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, problem solving. So artificial intelligence is essentially building a program, writing some code, or building a machine that appears intelligent to the user in some domain, right? So it appears to be doing something intelligent. Um, strong or general AI is something that you may or may have heard about, which is like building a system that's good at everything. So, you know, this is sort of like the singularity or something like that. General AI, strong AI. This is the sort of thing that like Google and Tencent and Baidu and, um, all those sorts of people are trying to do is build this AI that, that knows everything. So John McCarthy coined the term AI. He developed Lisp and he won a Turing award. So maybe we should listen to what he has to say. 
So John McCarthy says that AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It is related to the task of using computers to understand human intelligence, but AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable, right? So if you go ask someone who's not a computer scientist what AI is, they'll probably tell you like, okay, it's like the Terminator, it's robotics, right? But it's not always about things that appear human. AI is, is much, much more than that. So academic AI, like what I do for my research, for example, is we want to create usually the most intelligent, most intelligence. Let me edit that. Um, oh, one of the pieces of feedback I got was that people wish that I would release the slides before class, but this is why I don't. It's because I go through the slides and make changes to any uh, correction or any corrections, and then I upload them after so that you get the best version. So that was an example of that. All right, so academic AI, the thing us professors do, and grad students and PhDs and postdocs, um, is to create the most intelligent system for a set of tasks using any available resource, right? So I might say, I want the best StarCraft AI, so I'll do whatever I can for that. As academics, our goal is to publish papers and perform research, right? So we want to write papers, they get reviewed, they get submitted to conferences, they get submitted to journals, and our goal is to have those publications because that's how we're evaluated by our superiors at the university, right? Um, we're interested mostly in theoretical performance, right? So we'll, you know, talk about big O notation, um, algorithmic performance, that sort of thing. Um, we're not always super concerned with things like actual clock, you know, wall clock running times, making things um, super robust. Uh, we write what we call like research code, which is just good enough to work but not good enough to be run by anyone but us, right? If anyone else runs my code, it'll all crash. Um, so you write the code for the paper and then that's pretty much it. Um, we're interested in things that can sort of be proven beyond some statistical, statistical probability, right? So my method is better than this method by 6.2%. That's the sort of thing that, that we want. Um, sometimes it's interested in non-game related problems and Usually there are very few end users for the work of academic AI. What I mean is like, I'm going to publish a paper. It's going to, the paper's going to go somewhere. And, you know, maybe, maybe if I publish my code, 10 people might ever go look at that code. There are very few end users for most academic AI work. Okay. Um, I've had a lot of people use my stuff because I've released a bunch of stuff on GitHub. Um, like StarCraft AI bots, tutorials, that sort of thing. So like hundreds of people have used my work, but that's not like the millions that play video games. So industry AI has a lot more end users, for example. So how does academic AI research actually get performed? So if you, you know, if you're not a grad student, you, you probably don't know what, like, what is the life of a grad student? What is the life of a professor when it comes to actually doing AI research? Well, it goes like this. First, you have to identify a problem or an area to work in. So for example, if you come to me and you're my new grad student, we'll have a few meetings and say, okay, what are you interested in? Well, I like, I really like neural networks. Um, I really like, uh, like heuristic search algorithms. So maybe we could find something in that area. Or you could say, I really love MOBA games, Dota, League of Legends. I love that. Could we do an AI for a League of Legends game or some, something, something like that? So we'll identify a problem or a type of algorithm that we want to work on. Then what you do is before you start writing, you do a literature review of all the existing techniques that are out there, right? So for example, if I said, well, I want to, I'm interested in neural nets, it's not okay to just write a neural net and try and publish that paper because, you know, neural nets exist. <laughs> People have written them before. Or if I have this idea, here's a horror story for you. I know someone who was in the fourth year of their PhD in mathematics. And as they were writing their thesis, someone sent them an email who was a colleague of theirs and said, I just found this paper from 1992 or, you know, within that time range that did what you're trying to do and they did it better. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and so what happened was they did the literature review in the math field, but someone found a paper in physics that did what they were trying to do. And it was just straight up better. And they literally had to throw out everything that they'd done. And so you have to do a good literature review because when it comes to publishing a paper, you can't publish something second. You have to publish it first. Like academia is very stressful. You know, people just think, okay, profs, you know, we teach and then we sit in our ivory towers and in our massage chairs and do nothing except tell students that they're terrible. But like, it's actually pretty stressful because if you know that someone else is working in your field, you have to race them because if you don't publish first, there's no way you can prove that you didn't copy their work, right? So it's, you got to find out what's been done before you start doing anything. Then you develop some new techniques. So you rack your brain. This is the hard part, right? How do you just pull new ideas out of the air? It's kind of like saying, how do you write a new song, right? How do people, how do musicians, how do they come up with just a new song? How do you come up with a new algorithm, right? If you think it's hard learning an algorithm, Try developing a new algorithm. That's, it sucks. It's, it's like a lot of work. You're sitting there thinking all the time and it's crazy. So what we do, just like you would in music, is you'd go listen to a bunch of music, right? You go read a bunch of papers, you get some inspiration and you say, what if I took like this song, but I added some banjo or something? I don't know, right? I'm not a musician. So you take this thing, you add this thing, all of a sudden it's better. You develop some new techniques. All right. Then once you have a new technique created, you test it, right? So we're going to test that technique against current state of the art um, under specific controlled circumstances. So if you have a new pathfinding algorithm and you think it's better than the old pathfinding algorithm, you get a bunch of video game maps and you run your algorithm and the new algorithm a thousand times on all the maps and then you see who, who did better, right? So you measure it in terms of uh, amount of nodes generated, the amount of time it took, the quality of the solutions, and then you write a paper and you say, here's my thing, it's better or worse. And that's the analysis of the, of the experiments. And then if, only after all of this, if your new stuff is better and you can prove it with a statistical significance, then you can publish your paper. Okay? So, you know, the games industry has it good. <laughs> you know, if you're Zynga, you can go out and copy another game. If you're Riot Games and you're like, I want to make millions of dollars. What am I going to do? I'm going to copy Auto Chess and call it Team Fight Tactics. I'm going to copy Counter-Strike and call it... Like, uh, you know, like there's games out there that you can't copy stuff in academic research. It has to be new, right? But I'm not saying that, you know, Industry, if you get away with it, if people buy it, then it's not your fault, right? Keep publishing all that stuff that people that people buy. So, all right. So academic research, the time frame. if you're an MSc student, you're going to spend between two and three years doing coursework and AI research. A PhD student will spend anywhere between four and seven years working on a, a subfield of AI. My, my PhD took seven years. Took a long ass time, <laughs> but you know, um, I learned a lot and got a good job. So it, it was worth it. Um, go if you're Google, you spend a hundred million dollars on deep learning to learn to play Go and Starcraft. I don't have a hundred million dollars. Google has a hundred million dollars. That's, uh, it's crazy what people are doing today in, in industry. Um, in, well, Google does have academics working for it. So I wouldn't call this industry AI. This is more academic AI with a lot of funding. All right, so that's that's how academic AI works if you didn't know beforehand, okay? So that'll be your life if you become a grad student. Let's, let's get down a little bit more into the details of AI. So let's categorize artificial intelligence into different subfields so we can start to make sense of it. Because if I just say, I work in artificial intelligence, I might as well say, I work in computers right? Who doesn't work in artificial intelligence these days? There's a bunch of buzzwords out there. You know, every company uses AI whatever when they really mean an if statement, let's be real. Um, so let's categorize AI into what it actually is and not what companies tell you it is, okay? So there's two ways that you can categorize subfields of artificial intelligence. One would be 
by categorizing the algorithmic techniques that would be considered artificial intelligence. And the other way would be categorizing the application domains of artificial intelligence, right? So let's have a look. So artificial intelligence, if we're looking at techniques, for example, we can say machine learning. Machine learning is a type of technique used for artificial intelligence that can be applied to many different domains. So machine learning is a technique. It can be applied to many different domains, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Not used to talking yet. First lecture of the term is always the worst. My uh, throat has to get used to talking for so long. Another subfield, <clears throat> geez, is called natural language processing. That involves things like translation, classification, clustering, information extraction. Um, natural language processing can also, one second. Can also use terms, excuse me, water stuck in my throat can also use techniques such as machine learning. So natural language processing is more of a domain specification rather than a technique specification. We can have speech, such as text-to-speech, speech-to-text, expert systems, planning, scheduling, and optimization, robotics, vision, video games, all these sorts of um, different things. My areas of research in particular are in um, a little bit of machine learning, mostly reinforcement learning, I do a lot of planning, schedule, and optimization, especially in video games, and I do do some robotics as well, okay? So the current state of the art in AI, in my opinion, involves two main sub areas of techniques, machine learning and heuristic search. And if you did 3200, you know what these things are already. Machine learning can be broken down into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, okay? Supervised learning is when you are given, um, and I'm not gonna go into that right now because we're not gonna do a lot of machine learning in this course and you already did 3200. So supervised learning, when you have a supervisor, you're given trained, you're given labeled data and you learn some predictor. Unsupervised learning is when you are given no labeled data and you have to just make some patterns out of the data. So this is like clustering as an example of that. Reinforcement learning we talked about at length in 3200, um, but that's all about learning um, what actions to do via interaction with the environment. Search-based AI, um, you can think of like, you know, exhaustively searching all the possible, act all the possible actions you can do. Um, so we did things in 3200, like um, the A-star search algorithm, breadth first search, um, depth first search. We also talked about two-player search, like alpha, beta, um, a little talked a little bit about Monte Carlo tree search, that sort of thing. However, the current state of the art is in combining these two, in my opinion. So in the past, researchers would focus on either using search or machine learning. But in the past five, 10 years, most of the success has come out of using both. So researchers have combined the exploration of heuristic search algorithms with learning policy and state evaluations to produce better, better results than either of them could have done by themselves. So Google did this um, with AlphaGo, where they beat Lee Sedol using a combination of heuristic search and um, uh, deep reinforcement learning. So they had heuristic search, Monte Carlo tree search, and deep reinforcement learning. So they had deep neural nets learning different networks. Um, and that ended up beating the world champion at Go. And later they did the same thing with StarCraft. And another group did that with poker. And so they're combining heuristic search and deep learning to make really intelligent things. Um, what can AI actually do? Well, you've seen these slides before in 3200. We have planning and scheduling, autonomous control, image and pattern recognition, healthcare, robotics, music, art, um, procedural content generation, language processing, take over the world, obviously. But now we get to this course where we have game playing, right? Let's talk about video games already. All right. How do we test new AI? We play games. So in 3200, we already went over this. Games measure intelligence. Believe it or not, video games do measure intelligence as well, despite what your teammates in 
League of Legends might let you know, it does take a little bit of intelligence to play video games. And in my opinion, everything is a game, right? What is a game? In a game, you have an agent in an environment. That agent takes actions. The action affects the environment. The agent has some sort of goal. Defeat the opponent, move to the right, solve the puzzle, get the most points. We're trying to maximize some function, right? And if you think about it, this is sort of what life is as well. You're an agent in an environment. You have some sort of goal. Maybe that goal is just make it through this lecture. Maybe the goal is, you know, find a nice partner that you can have a life with. Maybe it's make the most money possible. It's a game and you're playing it. There are other people. And sometimes in order for you to get something, they might not get something, right? Like if two people are applying for a job, that's a game. And you've got to win that game to get that one job and the other person doesn't get it. It's unfortunate, but that's that's the way life is sometimes. All right. AI and games. Why do we care so much about AI for video games? Um, well, games can simulate the real world too. So even though just making AI for games is enough reason in itself, games can simulate the real world. So if we have good AI for games, we can translate that into some other like real world thing. We don't need ethics for games. If you've ever talked to any researchers in like the biomedical field, especially when it comes to COVID and stuff, oh my God, dealing with people. If you even ask someone a question in your research, sometimes you have to like get an ethics review of the questions that you ask. It's, it's brutal. Um, they're cheap. Um, video games are relatively cheap in comparison to say robotics or doing a study in the real world. They're easy to visualize. They're intuitive to play. They're fun to program. They're fun to play, right? Like games are, they're called games for a reason because we enjoy, um, we enjoy playing them and they help motivate people to learn. Um, so in the past, I've, I've I sp spoke about this in 3200 a lot. Uh, oh, by the way, for people who keep hearing me talk about 3200, that's the intro to AI course. That's a prerequisite for, for this class. So AI has been used to beat the world champion humans at chess, poker, go, Jeopardy. Like, it's crazy. Like, almost any game you can imagine, AI is now better than, than humans. Um, I just said all of that. So, yeah, human versus machine. Um, chess has been conquered. Checkers was solved. Go has been solved. Starcraft... Uh, Alpha Star can kind of beat some pro players. I don't know if they're beating the world champion just yet, but it's not like obviously better. So we'll leave the, we'll leave StarCraft off of it for now. Um, only a few years ago, when I started this course, uh, only two of these check marks existed. Like this is still moving. You are still in like the golden age of game AI where, where not everything is solved yet. So that's pretty cool. So academic AI... Why would academic AI want to use games? Well, we want to publish new techniques. The goal, if we recall, is to make the most intelligent system possible. And so we could hopefully apply that to a more general um, uh, domain, like real life. So researchers are going to test their new techniques in various games. So I could test it in chess, in StarCraft, in, in Dota, whatever. And games not, are not necessarily the end goal of academic research, but they are the test environment for academic research. So that's a big difference between academic AI and industry video game AI. If you see games in academic AI, games are usually the test environment that helps you to publish. They're not necessarily the end goal of your AI system. All right, enough about academic AI. What is industry video game AI? What is that? So. Basically, the game designer needs an AI feature and the AI programmer has to implement it. That is industry video game AI. It's essentially doing what your boss tells you to do, right? It could be anything from, um, we've got a chess video game, we need a chess AI, all the way to, um, here's a platformer, this uh, Goomba has to follow Mario or this uh, Koopa has to walk back and forth and bounce off of walls that it hits. Something as simple as that, versus maybe it's like the new Rome Total War game where you need an AI system that can control thousands of military units, right? 
or it's uh, an MMORPG where you have uh, a scripted boss encounter. That's still AI. Or if you're making a game like um, The Witcher and you need uh, a like a narrative type system, right? Like you interact with, with entities and those entities have responses. And, you know, if you say, I'm going to kill you, they're going to attack you. Or if you say, I love you, they're going to kiss you or something like that. That is game AI. Um, if you have a game like League of Legends, where you have the creeps that, you know, or the towers, the tower is going to target you. If you uh, hit an opponent under them, that is all game AI. It's essentially anything that, a non-player character does is considered game AI, okay? And as the game AI programmer, you have to implement that feature. That is industry game AI in a nutshell. It has to run very, very fast. A game running at 60 frames per second has 1,000 divided by 60, which is approximately 16 milliseconds to do all of its calculations on every frame of the game, okay? So if the whole game has 16 milliseconds, and the thing that they're probably most concerned with is graphics and physics, then the AI system is probably going to get at most one or two milliseconds per frame to run. Game AI is very concerned with optimizations and running code very, very quickly. And we're going to show that in assignment two. We're going to have a little competition in assignment two to run as fast as we can. All right. It oftentimes has less time and less budget than academic AI. So, for example, <clears throat> your game designer comes to you and says, well, it's July and we want to ship this game by Christmas. So... That's it. You have until Christmas. No matter how good it is, uh, we're shipping it at Christmas, right? You might have a couple of months, even a couple of weeks to work on the AI system for your actual video game. If you're a grad student, you know, you sit down with your supervisor, you might have two or three years to work on this thing. So you have more time. Depending on the game, the budget, you know, if you're a grad student at MUN, you probably don't have the budget of a AAA video game. But if you are Google, you have a lot more budget than a video game, right? So budget is a bit weird. Oftentimes, video game AI is, is less general and more hard-coded. Now, I don't mean hard-coded in the sense of like, it's scripted, where it's like, if this happens, do this. It's hard-coded in that, like, it has a very specific target of this game, right? So, for example, in academic AI, you have to be able to argue that your algorithm applies to a bunch of different subject areas. Like, it can be used in robotics, it can be used in blah, it can be used by, it can cure cancer, all this kind of stuff. But the AI system for your game only has to work for your game. So it's, it's sort of hard targeted toward that game, which can be a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing because you don't have to worry about all these other domains that it could be um, targeted to. But it's kind of a curse because now if your game ever changes, like if there's a balance patch or something like that, now you might have to go and, oh, now I have, well, grenades are, they got buffed. So now my AI has got to tone down the grenade usage or something like that. It, it can be a little bit annoying. And most importantly is that the resulting AI has to be very, very stable. It will be used possibly by millions of people. And it's got to work. It can't crash, right? It's not like academic AI where you ran it 10 times and one time it didn't crash. So that was the result you used for the paper. I've heard of it happening. You've, it's got to be stable, right? It's got to be very well done. You're part of a software engineering crew. Software engineering is much more of a, of a thing in, in industry AI than it is in, in academic AI. All right. This is a common misconception. Industry AI is not worse AI than academic. It's not necessarily even less complicated than academic AI, right? It just has a different goal in mind than academic AI. The goal of the AI in academic AI, other than keep your boss happy, is to entertain the player. It's to sell more copies of your game, right? It's no good 
to have the most intelligent possible, like, first-person shooter opponents, if all they do is headshot you, it's not fun to play against, right? So if you were doing an academic AI for a first-person shooter, you'd make the thing that had perfect aim and it, like, timed all the item pickups and it would be just, like, impossible to defeat. That's not what you want to play against as a new player to the game, right? Fun is a much harder goal than intelligence. You can measure intelligence. You can't, there's no formula for fun, right? So in my opinion, 90% of the time, industry video game AI is like harder to work on than academic AI. People don't give them enough credit, right? So if you're playing a game and you're a new player versus you're playing a game as an experienced player, the AI has got to be fun to play against for both people. Now, oftentimes you can sort of cheat that with like difficulty settings, but now how do you work difficulty settings into your AI system, right? It's a very difficult problem. Later on, I, I worked on the AI system for um, a retail video game called Prismata. And toward the end of the course, once we've learned a bunch of stuff, I'll show you what I did and how difficult this problem is. It, it, was, it was a really great experience. Industry AI programmers often have a much deeper knowledge of implementation, especially hardware and programming, than academics due to their constraints. So the constraints being, it might have to run on specific hardware. It might have to run in two milliseconds. It can never crash. It has to produce results within this specific range. They're like, it, I would, if, if you said, who would you want working for you? Would you want some grad student in AI or someone who has two or three years in, in industry? I'd take the industry person every time because they've been beaten over the head with a stick of it must work, <laughs> right? It's please never say that industry game AI is like worse or less complicated than academic AI. It's, it's oftentimes the complete opposite. All right. For industry video game AI, the AI should be exactly smart enough but not smarter than necessary, right? Um, the intelligence required in the AI system depends on the interaction between the agents, the AI agents, and the players, right? So maybe if you have an enemy that you're shooting against, you don't want it to be too smart, but if you have an AI that's that you're escorting, you would want that to be very smart because escort quests suck. Right? We don't want the thing to stop every two seconds, etc. The longer the AI interaction is on screen, the more likely it is to look dumb. And it's very easy to misinterpret the intelligence of things. Um, so this is a fun little story that I wish I, I should have a slide on the screen um, when I tell this story. Um, and we're going a couple of minutes over on this class, but that's the, the benefit of, of teaching online. Someone came to a conference once, and this was the person who wrote the AI system for the original Warcraft 2 game. So Warcraft 2, amazing RTS game, successor to StarCraft, uh, well, successor to StarCraft, or Warcraft 3, technically. Um, he was writing the AI system, so when you played against the computer, that was, that was his algorithm controlling the units. And so, <laughs> there was this map where... At a certain time, well, here's how the AI system actually worked. Uh, as you progress through the map, your goal was to get to the bottom right of the screen, right? To rescue the whatever. And so you had to cut through the trees. You had to defeat some enemies. They would ambush you at specific times. You have to build a base. And then um, eventually, once you defeat everything, you'd, you'd like save the gold mine or whatever. Um, so the way that the AI worked was that as you progress through the level at some specific points, um, the AI would spawn just out of your vision and walk toward you. But it gave the appearance that it was, it had a base somewhere, they were producing units and like sending it at you, right? So in your mind, there's some base out there producing these units, but in actuality, it just spawns some units every now and then and sends it at you. It also had a little bit of flavor in, in that some, it had this like Zeppelin. So a Zeppelin was a flying scouting unit. 
and the AI's Zeppelin unit was just on a loop, okay? So it was on a loop that circled the map like once every two minutes or something. And that's all it did. It didn't convey, like the AI could see the whole map anyway. It didn't need that unit. It was just like for, for some sort of looming threat or whatever. And then as soon as you reach the shore, some AI ships would spawn and attack your settlement near the shore or whatever. So he told a story and he said, um, like the CEO of, of Blizzard at the time or the project lead or whoever came in and said, let me do some play testing. I want to see how the AI system is coming along. So he sat down and he play tested and after he was done, he said, oh my God, this AI system is incredible. It's so smart. I was going through the woods and I was so scared, like the enemies were producing these units. And then this Zeppelin came and it scouted me. And as soon as it scouted me, they sent the units to my exact location and they knew exactly where it was. Like, how did, like, this is amazing. Like, the, like that's a great AI system. And the guy said, yes, it is. And I totally meant all of that, right? So the point being, as long as the boss was happy, and it appeared intelligent, that's what you care about. That, that is your goal, is to make sure the user has fun. And the user had fun. And so even though it was a little bit dumb and it didn't use a bunch of fancy algorithms, it accomplished its goal of making the game fun to play. So sometimes those little dumb things with, you know, a little bit of flavor can really, can really make things um, enjoyable for, for your users. So game AI isn't just about intelligence. It often involves aspects of games that aren't strictly intelligent. Good AI is good animation. It's good game design. It's good sound design. It studies human behavior and it presents human behavior, right? So I'm sure you've all played a game where the animations were terrible. And so no matter how intelligent something is, if things are just T-posing all over the place, you kind of laugh at it, right? Um, it's good sound design thing. Have the sound correctly. If, if you get ambushed and there was no footsteps, well, you're going to be really mad about that. So it involves all of these things in this course. We're not going to get into animation. We're not going to get into sound at sound design, but I just want you to let you know that these are things that are closely coupled with the AI system in a real video game. So how do you build good AI then for games while well, you observe the world, right? How do people move in conversations? How far do people stand apart? How do new people join a conversation? How do people avoid each other in the streets when you're walking down in GTA? How is your gaze adjusted if you start talking to somebody, right? So if the NPC continues to look at a wall while you're talking to them, that's really concerning. So things in AI are oftentimes the same things that you see in cartoons and animation. Exaggeration is often the key right? If people can't notice the AI doing something, then it basically doesn't exist, right? So this was a cool story from uh, Halo. So the, the AI programmer for Halo said, in Halo, the grunts ran away when an elite is killed. So there's a group of, there's a group of grunts and an elite, like a boss of that group, right? And the AI was supposed to say, if the elite is killed, all the grunts run away. So the, the game design thing that they're supposed to be delivering to the user is kill the leader. You don't have to kill all the other guys, right? But here was the problem. Initially, nobody noticed. So we had to keep adding clues to make it more obvious. By the time we shipped, we had made it. So not only does every single grunt run away every single time an elite is killed, but they all have an outrageously exaggerated panically run where they wave their hands above their heads, they scream in terror, and half the time they will say, leader dead, run away. I would still estimate that less than a third of our, our users made the connection, right? So you have to factor the users in as well. Even if you put in something cool or clever like this, it may not even be noticed. So you have to exaggerate some things when you're doing AI. So here's some key game AI ideas. Communicate the AI effectively to a player. Make sure they are getting the intended goal out of the AI. Use audio, video, any sense that you can. Rumble if you're if you have a controller, etc. 
Only simulate or build what you can effectively communicate. Don't build entire systems that the player won't see. Entertain and engage the player with the AI. The goal shouldn't be just to slaughter them, right? Maybe you have, uh, you know, one difficulty setting in there for the hardcores where it does slaughter them, but it's not the goal to just poop on your players, unless it's a Dark Souls game. All right. Some, some AI design goals. Um, maybe you have, you want your AI to be part of a new player tutorial. So you have a steep learning curve in your game. You want people to learn the game. That could be one design goal. Maybe experienced players want a new challenge in your game. Maybe you want more enjoyable single player, right? Maybe you want modular design so you could have, uh, AI difficulty settings. If you have, um, for example, if you're playing like a, if you have an AI system for a MOBA game or an RTS game, maybe you're going to have balance patches all over the place. Maybe some units um, are going to have like more damage or less hit points or cost more gold. And so, you know, you've got to have things that are robust to change. Your AI system shouldn't have to be reprogrammed every time a new balance patch comes out. So these are some of the design goals that you should look for when you're uh, making a game. Some of the benefits of, of game AI, well, you have better game AI, right? So you have a better single player experience. You sell more copies of your game. You could even create offline tools for game balancing. You could create AI tools for, for human testing, sell more games, right? So these are old numbers. Hundreds of billions of dollars were spent on video games, you know, three, four years ago. So this has just blown up a lot, especially since the pandemic. So even if your goal is just to sell games, this is reason enough to find game AI interesting, right? But there's all this other stuff going on as well. Um, really quickly, I know we're over time. Just some of my research, like if you want to know what I work on, I do uh, build order planning and optimization for StarCraft. So I won't get into too many details, but build orders for StarCraft. I've done, um, I, I've done heuristic search algorithms for this. I've also written simulators for StarCraft combat and done things like alpha beta for StarCraft combat, where we do like um, turn, not in a turn based, but like simultaneous move combat actions with durations. I uh, run StarCraft AI competitions. So um, I've been hosting a competition for 11 years now, 12 years. Jeez, it's, it's, it's a long time. Um, we hold this competition at Memorial. We have people from all over the world submitting. I've written uh, StarCraft bots. So I have UAlberta bot. Um, I incorporate my research into this bot. It's competed a bunch of a bunch of times. It it uh, won a competition. It's the, still the only bot that plays the random race in the competitions. I did the AI for um, a game called Prismata. I wrote a new algorithm called Hierarchical Portfolio Search, which I'll talk about later. This is a real game. It's it's on Steam. You can play it for free if you're interested. That game has an absolutely gigantic um, state space. And so I had to create a new system um, that, that uses a portfolio-based method. Uh, I do research in AI for video game development and design and testing. So like writing solvers for games to generate puzzles, um, doing some procedural content generation using genetic algorithms, etc. Okay, so that, that's what I do in just like a few seconds. If you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, we can totally chat about it. Uh, if not, that's fine. Just stick to the course material. So that is the first lecture. Um, that was the course outline, a bit of an intro to AI, and I hope you know what it's all going to be about. So just remember that, oh, and I should also say, uh, this Thursday is, so the next lecture, I'm not going to actually give that lecture because if you're, so we're going to be using C++ for the first three assignments in this course, C++ and SFML. And um, if you do StarCraft for your project, you'll have a, for the project, you'll have a choice between uh, Minecraft and StarCraft. If you do StarCraft, you'll be using C++. So there'll be a lot of C++ in this course. So last term, I taught an entire course on C++ game programming. As part of that, I gave two introductory lectures on C++. So Thursday, I'm not going to be giving a live lecture. What you can do, if you want, is you can go look at the, C the intro to C++ and intro to SFML lectures that I gave for that course. There's really no reason for me to just say the same thing again 
to you guys, okay? So if you're familiar with C++ already, these are sort of optional, but here I give a, um, like a very basic introduction to C++, here's that lecture. And then in the second one, I go into more about like low level memory details, uh, et cetera. So that is your introduction to C++. If you're already a C++ guru, or if you took Computer Science 4300, you do not need to watch these lectures, okay? But if you're new to C++, please watch those lectures. Then after the scheduled class time on Thursday, so after 3.30 p.m., Quiz 1 will be available on D2L. So you go to D2L, you go to this course, and you go to quizzes, and you'll see that Quiz 1 is available. Quiz 1 will be available until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. You have to open it before then, and it, it, it's a half an hour in total for that quiz. And we'll do that every week. So every Thursday, the quiz opens, and every Sunday, that's when you have to have it finished by. So I give you a few days to watch the lectures, etc. All right. So I'm not going to see you live on Thursday, but I will see you live in one week, and we're getting right into the first assignment. So watch those lectures on C++, because we'll be talking about Visual Studio and Assignment 1 um, next Tuesday, one week from now. So we're jumping straight into the programming, and then after that lecture is when we get into talking about more, more academic side of things. All right. Thank you so much. I can't wait to uh, continue on with this course. And I'll see you next time for the next lecture.